The effects of the opioid epidemic that Mark and Julia chronicled stretched far beyond Maryland. In 2017, drug overdoses killed an estimated 72,000 people in the U.S., with 49,000 of those due to opioids. New York City alone accounted for around 1,500 overdose deaths last year. As the opioid crisis continues to trigger record high fatal overdoses across America, NNSC and Mother Jones are hosting today's event to raise awareness and examine what is being done to fight this deadly epidemic and what strategies we need to rethink because maybe they're just not working. Following the screening, we invite you to join us for a discussion with the filmmaker, reporter, and a panel of New Yorkers concerned about the opioid crisis in our very own city. After the panel, we invite you to stay for a reception where you can meet the director and the panelists. The reception will be right outside in the criminal justice quad where the elevator bank is. Lastly, I would like to thank the Office of the, for the Advancement of Research at John Jay College for providing funding that helped us host this event tonight. I would like to thank Mother Jones and their entire team for being here and partnering with us on this. I would like to thank our director, David Kennedy, for making all of this a possibility and John Jay College and President Carol Mason. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the creator of this incredible documentary, Mark Helenowski. Mark is the award-winning filmmaker of the feature-length documentary For Grace, streaming on Netflix. Mark currently serves as the inaugural documentary filmmaker in residence at Mother Jones. He has spoken on pa film panels in Auckland, New Zealand, to Austin, and has created commercial content for Gatorade, Nike, Virgin, and more. Please help me to welcome Mark Helenowski. Yeah, awesome, cool. Uh, thank you everyone for, for coming out tonight. It's really, really cool to see everyone and for the very lovely introduction. I'm glad that you edited it down from that massive, gross wall of words uh, that's up there. Um, so yeah, really quick, you know, I'm a, a inaugural documentary filmmaker here at Mother Jones. Um, you know, the cool thing about Mother Jones is, you know, Mother Jones allows us to tell kind of the stories that we're looking to tell. Uh, right after I joined, I sat down with my senior uh, editor, James West, and his first question to me was, what kind of stories did I want to tell? What did I want to dig into? Uh, and this was the result of that conversation. Personally, I've had uh, opioids touch my life. A uh, very close and direct family member passed away uh, years ago due to fentanyl, which is when I first found out about fentanyl. Uh, that's the first time I heard that name. I didn't know what it was. So for me, this was kind of uh, an opportunity to dig into what that is and, and how that affects lives. Julia Lurie, our uh, wonderful reporter sitting in the front there, that's kind of her beat. She's been on the opioid beat now for a few years with Mother Jones, so it ended up being a fantastic uh, uh, collaboration for me and Julia to get together, go down to Baltimore, and what we thought we would find, we thought we would kind of profile um, you know, a certain person that ends up in the film uh, and, and tell their story really in depth, but when we got there, we, we realized things were a lot different than what we had expected. That gray area uh, between punitive measures uh, between between treatment, uh, wait, ways to treat this problem, it's it's a lot more uh, maybe than I expected since I'm new to this world. Um, I mean, really, you know, I think the documentary speaks generally for itself. I can't say too much more about it. Uh, so thank you everyone for for coming. I'm really excited to hear what the panelists have to say uh, after the screening today. And uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's go for it. Everybody depressed enough? Yes. Yeah. I have that feeling a lot about the work that, that the National Network does. Uh, we, we are first and foremost a violence prevention shop at the National Network. Um, but we focus really on the issues that cause the most harm in the most vulnerable communities. Um, and we just had a major dose of that. So can I get the panelists up here, please? So let me just briefly talk about uh, our format here. So we've, we've got a wonderful group here. To my immediate left is Stephen Levin, who's a councilman for the city of New York. 
Uh, next is Marilyn Reyes, who is, uh, among many other things, the co-chair of the Peer Network of New York and first responder, second responder extraordinaire. To her left is Julia Lurie, whose work is behind what you've just seen. Um, the last note that we saw on the screen was, now go read the article, and I can endorse that. Um, I've been fortunate enough to, to do some work before this with Julia, and she is, to my mind, doing the best reporting from the ground up on this issue of anybody doing this work right now. So glad you're here with us. Julia has graciously agreed to sit on her hands for a little bit because she has spoken with her pen and her camera. Um, and I am going to pose a question to the, the other panelists. So when I've, I've spoken with Julie about this, when she sums up what she thinks about what she's seeing um, on the ground in the country, it, it, at least in one instance, boiled down to everybody's working really hard and nobody thinks it's working. And so the, the question I'd like to put to the panelists, all, all of whom are in directly engaged in this issue in, in their own way, is what are you seeing out there? Um, what, what, if anything, feels positive, what seems like it's working, and what could we be doing that we are not doing? And we're going to take half an hour, 40 minutes up here, and then we'll open things up. Sir? Um, so I want to thank you all for, for being here um, and this, um, this wonderful panel. And I'm, I'm sorry I didn't see the entire film, but I look forward to, to watching it later and reading the article. Um, uh, so um, to answer the question, what am I seeing out there? I'm seeing uh, in the communities that, um, that I represent and uh, the communities that I am part of, you know, friends and, and family and co-workers, um, uh, I am seeing uh, an increase in, in people using. I'm seeing an increase over the last five years um, of, um, of people um, getting hooked starting on, um, starting on pills. Um, graduating uh, to heroin, um, seeing somebody very close to me struggle with meth right now. Um, I am seeing evidence, you know, when I look, if I'm looking for it, I see it all over the place. I see it on the street, I see it um, in, the, in my building, I see it uh, in the parking lot where I park my car. Um, I saw a bag. Uh, on the landing on the floor in my apartment building last night, um, an empty bag. So um, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing more and more people becoming addicted. Um, and what I am, in terms of what am I seeing that's positive, not, not a whole lot. Um, I am, I'm, Searching, I'm trying to think of what public policy um, measures can be taken from a city perspective. I'm a city council member, so I engage with the city hospital system, uh, with district attorneys, with the Department of Health, with the homeless system. Um, I'm the chair of the committee that oversees the homeless system. Um, I'm searching for meaningful measures. How do we increase peer-to-peer -peer counseling? How do we connect people that are ready for medically assisted treatment with medically assisted treatment when they need it, when they want it, when they're ready, right then and there? And we don't have that type of infrastructure in New York City. We should have that infrastructure in New York City. We don't. Um, I have, I'm a, as a city council member, I have three years left in the city council. And um, one of the things that I really want to try to focus on is how do we make sure that we are, when they're reaching people when they're ready to come off and with the resources that are most effective at that time, at that exact moment, in the ERs, peer to peer. So, I, but it's, it's, it's rough. I'm seeing more and more evidence every day and I don't think we're winning this war at all or even coming close right now. 
Yes, I don't see us winning right now, but I am on the ground every day fighting to save lives. Um, I've been very much part of VOCAL with the advocacy for safer consumption spaces. Now that the mayor calls it overdose prevention sites, that's okay too, as long as it saves lives. And I think once they stop fighting up in between Albany and the city, and get these, these overdose prevention sites, we're gonna see a real change in people staying alive. Because I'm from the Bronx, born and raised. My, where I'm from, right now the South Bronx, is a war zone. I have to catch my breath. Every day I go outside and I hear somebody died from an overdose, and it breaks my heart because that person didn't have to die. I mean, I, I go in my community every Thursday between eight and noon, eight in the morning to noon. We, we, I belong to a, a, a group called the Opioid Collective, which is part of the BID, the business initiative in the Bronx, right? And we got together because it's crazy, the numbers are crazy, my people are dying, and we don't know what to do. You know, the elected officials say they stand by us, blah, 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 but nothing's really getting pushed in time, and we're losing too many. So what we did was we got together, there's Acacia Network, there's Samar Samaritan Village, there's the PN Network of New York, and we go out there and we engage and we come from harm reduction, where we just meet someone where they're at. And we had to teach Ocasio Network and Samar Samaritan Village how to do that, because it's hard when you're trying to reach out to someone and, and you come out and you say, are you ready to stop? No, 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 don't go that way. Don't even say that. Say, how can I help you? How are you doing today? You know, just, do you need a hug? I, I'll hug anybody, that's just me. I'll hug everybody until they start talking to me. You know, but I go out there and I do a nar naloxone trainings that carry it with you. It doesn't matter, you can save a life. If you don't, some people say, oh, I don't use drugs. That's okay, but at least you have the medication that can be reversed an overdose that can save someone in your community or, or a child or a parent, whoever, whoever, because in this community is very high. And then we have different choices. You have people here that can link you to abstinence, you have people here that can link you to MAT, which is medication assisted treatment, bup, methadone, Vivitrol. And then there's us that can link you to syringe exchange, condoms, um, counseling in a harm reduction agency. It doesn't matter, whatever it is that that person needs, we try our best. And the beauty of it is that we have somebody to come pick you up for detox right there. They just come. You know, all you gotta do is make a phone call. And some places, there's one per place they'll take you without Medicaid. Cause that's another barrier. If a person doesn't have health insurance, they can't get treatment. If a person doesn't have ID, so sometimes, you know, we've, we've kind of been pushing for it because, I mean, come on, people are homeless. They lose their, all their stuff. We need treatment now. We, we can't wait till tomorrow till they go to, um, the welfare center and maybe they have a copy. You know, it, but that's what happens. So now we found out that if you know somebody's social security number, they might be able to put it up some, some way. I don't know how that works, but I know that we're pushing for it. Because if someone is ready right that moment, that's the best time to get them. To bring them to whatever it is that they need. If it's methadone, if it's abstinence treatment, whatever. That's when you need to do it not wait until tomorrow or wait a week later or a month later, but then they could be dead. And we gotta save lives because nobody's gonna save us. No one is coming to save us. Now I'll leave you at that. <laughs> Gloria, you just said nobody is coming to save us. Um, and you, painted one, at least to me, really striking response to that, uh, which is the opi Opioid Collective. Can you tell us a little bit more about that 
how did that happen? How is it paid for? Who's doing that work? Just go a little deeper. All right. So the Bronx is getting gentrification, right? <laughs> so the businesses are, you know, they're starting to change the color, you know, change the area. We're getting a plaza, the Roberto Clemente Plaza. You know, we're starting to see the change coming, right? <laughs> and, and that's the reality. So they want to get rid of us. Oh, no, we need to get rid of them people, right? So somebody heard it, and then the Harm Reduction Coalition got involved. So then they came to the peer network, and they said, we need y'all to get involved. So I said, OK, no problem. I'm there, and I will speak my truth. I am, I'm not going to shut up. So they were like, we know. So I, they, I started going to the meetings, and, I, and we started talking about harm reduction, about how language is powerful when we engage someone, what to say, what not to say. And then we started decided to hit our target area where the overdose is very high. And people, and there's a lot of homelessness and stuff. So we all brought our expertise to it. Harm reduction. Then we have Acacia Network that has their own programs. We have Samaritan Village that had the MAT. So we all came together and decided Thursdays. You know, we have a meeting every other Wednesday. So we finally made, we involved the um, NYPD. And yeah, they get on my nerves. Sometimes I say how I feel, but I'm built, no, but I'm, I'm as a person that comes from my community, a former user, formerly incarcerated, Boricua woman, I've been traumatized by NYPD. And that's a, my reality. But we have good people that work for the NYPD. You know, I don't think, I, when I see police, I don't see them all bad, but I'm traumatized. My community comes from trauma. That's the bottom line. So. Sometimes, when I see them, I, I kind of relive my trauma. But I've learned how to get help for that. But, um, but I have no problem in telling them how I feel. And, and sometimes, you know, they'll say things, and I just learn to, like, breathe. Because it's the way they talk about us. We are human beings. Just because... Um, but anyway, we got them involved, so they come to the meeting. I don't even want to go there, because I'm going to go somewhere else. But <laughs> they started coming to the meeting, so now they come out with us. So you see, it's a collective of different people coming from, from different programs. And the NYPD trying to build their relationship with our community, even though I still question, you know. <laughs> but. I, it's good that they're building their relationship with the community because we need that. We don't need the, to be always fighting with police or police always arresting us because that's not solving nothing. Um, prison didn't stop me from using drugs. You know, what helped me stop using drugs was harm reduction. You know, but I'm glad that we're building that, but we come. We started engaging the community, right? Um, some people I already knew because that's my community. But, and we just started talking. We started giving out 150 sandwiches the first day we went out there. We went out with 150, 150 sandwiches with, with water and juice were gone, right? Then we started you know, saying we, um, we have services. Everybody brought their own flyer. This is what we do. Then we made these little prompt cards that on one side is all harm reduction, and the opposite side is for abstinence, MATs. So, I mean, we're doing really good with them cards. People love them cards because if they don't want to go today, they can make a phone call and call the organization. They'll like, like um, Acacia has the driver that comes and picks you up for detox. So if whenever they're ready, they could just make that phone call and just go. Or they, they want to go to a harm reduction and get syringes, they know where to go. They know who to call. So I mean, we're coming along. We've been doing this now for about 10 weeks. 
And it's coming along. We had um, Councilwoman Diane Ayala, you know. She, she donated money. She, she funded some money over to Acacia. And, you know, they're trickling it down. And also um, Councilman Rafael Salamanca. He also donated some money. So we're, we're coming along. And we go out there every, every week with 150 to 200 sandwiches. And it's going. And we're starting to see people go to detox. We're starting to see people get on methadone or bup because, you know, it's whatever they want. And I've also referred many people for detox, you know, because that's what they wanted. Um, some pe uh, there was like two people that wanted residential, so we kind of, I, li I linked them to somebody else. But I also just recently started a job. I'm not gonna say what organization, but I'm working part-time three days a week. And when someone has a non-fatal overdose, I get called in to, to respond. So I get a phone call for poison control telling me that such and such um, overdosed and I have to go to St. Barnabas Hospital. So I run to St. Barnabas Hospital and I engage the person and I've been having a lot of success there with that. So, you know, we're doing things in the Bronx too. And, you know, it's, hap it's starting to sh spread. So the word is starting to spread. So now we're looking into doing it at St. Mary's Park. That's the next um, targeted area. So it's coming along. And we all united together in this. Like, we're, we're different organizations and think differently, but we're coming together. Like, you could see the change even in the directors. They, they're actually coming out to the target area and actually trying to do some outreach, too. So it's really working. Um, so look, when, when, when the lights were down and I was listening to the room as we watched the documentary, one of the things that I noticed caused a stir was the fact that the president has declared a national emergency and that means $57,000. Right. What you're describing, at, at least partly, is an incredibly creative local response to a complete lack of national leadership. And I'll, I'll go with the public, sa public health commissioner in Baltimore to say that's not a partisan comment, it's a factual observation. Um, from the beginning of this in, in the epidemic that began with, with pill diversion, through the move into heroin, through the move into fentanyl, there has been nothing like a deliberate, purposeful, meaningful national response to this issue. So this is for the councilman um, who is living in the local reality that that has caused. What's that feel like from where you are? Well, I think from a, so from a New York City perspective, as we're seeing it play out in our city, um, you know, we had 1,500, 1,600, 1,700 overdoses in 2017, um, uh, fatal overdoses. Yeah. And that's, um, and that's, as you said, it's a, that's a plateau because uh, that was roughly a little, bit, a little bit more than it was the year before, which was a lot more than it was the year before that, which was a lot more than it was the year before that. And, um, you know, what was so moving about the story you just told was exactly that, that it, this, is a, this, is a, this was an intensive local response. Yeah. Um, this is everybody that you're connecting with. You know them, you, you, know, you know them personally. You've made that personal connection. Mm -hmm. Um, and if w I think what, what I would love to see happen from a New York City perspective, and you know, this is, we can all, we, can, we all have the power to affect what happens in our own communities, is we should be able to take what you're doing over the last 10 weeks with Acacia and Samaritan Village and St. Barnabas and use that as a model to expand to other communities. So there's about 50 community boards in New York City, or there's 50 council districts in New York City, 51. Um, everybody, everybody in New York City is, is, a, is part of a community. Every person that, that died last year 
from an overdose was part of a community. Yes. They were connected to people. They were connected to people that loved them, people that cared about them, people that, that are connected to other people. And um, you, there's inspiration to be drawn from what you're doing, which is let's take that model and let's apply that across the city. Let's do that. In a, let's 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 take <clears throat> the Acacia of Brooklyn, whatever you know, or you know what other organization? I, Samaritan Village is in Brooklyn, yeah. so or in Queens, um, and and let's use those lessons and apply them. Let's apply them. I mean, one thing that I would like to see, and I'm going to really try to push for a lot over the next couple of years. You know, we have a health and hospital system in New York City that has really fallen behind some of the work that our private hospitals are doing. So the, the, peer, the peer network that's, that's, um, that's some of the private hospitals are participating in, unfortunately, that's not, that's not our, our health and hospitals corporation system. So that's not happening at Bellevue. Um, the number of, of doctors and nurse practitioners and physician assistants that can prescribe bup. You know, it's, it was only in the couple of dozens out of health and hospitals. I think it's getting a little bit better. And, you know, I give some credit to the new president, uh, Mitchell Katz, who saw that and said, yeah, we've got to do better. But we need to leverage our resources, and our resources are our people, our organizations, and our infrastructure, and, and take that compassion and, 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 and effectiveness and, and, and spread it across the city. That's my opinion. I think that one thing that we tried to highlight in, in the film and one thing that, frankly, I don't envy you because this is a really hard area to navigate is like often users and dealers are the same population. We seem to have agreed at this point that users um, need treatment. They need, they need addiction treatment. They need help. And there also seems to be this basic agreement that dealers should be penalized in some way. No one seems to really know what to do with those people in the middle, and there are a lot of people in the middle. Um, so what do you do with someone who has dealt a fatal dose of a drug to someone who overdoses? Um, and maybe they're their friend or their boyfriend or their girlfriend or something. They probably didn't mean to kill that person. They did kill that person. Um, in some states, in some counties, that means that you are charged with murder. In other places, um, you might get a, a much lighter sentence. Um, we, we still don't really know, yeah, what, what to do. I think um, just zooming out to a federal level a little bit, the amount of um, stigma that is still playing into policy is, is something that I, I definitely want to note. Um, even just at a basic like funding level. So for example, right now, we probably actually haven't seen it in headlines much because there's been a lot of other stuff in headlines. But um, the Senate is, or the Congress is, is about to pass a really big opioid bill that Trump will probably sign that is sort of being hailed as this sweeping measure, this it's really great. Um, and it has some really good goals in it. Um, it will probably get about three and a half billion dollars of funding next year. So this is a big opioid initiative that would um, help get more treatment and, um, and more naloxone and, and all sorts of things. And just to put that in perspective, so three and a half billion dollars sounds like a lot of money. Um, back in, yeah, so, so if you look at uh, the amount of people that are dying right now. We have more people dying of overdoses now today than um, people who are dying of HIV AIDS at the peak of the AIDS epidemic. And when that epidemic was happening, um, Congress responded in 1990 with something called the Ryan White Act. And that was basically this massive influx of cash that was designed to get um, treatment dispersed to everyone who needed it and available. Earlier this year, a couple of senators, Elijah Cummings and Elizabeth Warren, suggested something similar for the opioid epidemic. Um, it was modeled directly off of that legislation, and it was $100 billion over 10 years. They had sort of like run the numbers, figured out that this was the amount of money that was needed to really make a dent. Um, that was laughed away. That was seen as, as completely ridiculous. Um, and so now we're sort of left with these iterative measures um, and we have three and a half billion for next year, which is better than nothing, yeah. and definitely more than it's been in the past. Um, 
and also just sort of not at all proportional to, to the scale of, of what we're seeing. So that is my happy remark for the evening. Can I say one thing? All right, so nationally, um, drug users, or, orgs, you know, unions, we have a campaign that has started. It's called Reframe the Blame. So that means if I use drugs and I die, I don't want my dealer to get charged with murder. So it, it's starting to pick up momentum and in two weeks I'll be in New Orleans in the Harm Reduction Coalition Conference and we're gonna do an action with it. So, you know, it's starting to pick up because this, just because a person uses drugs, that doesn't mean, and some dealers really don't know this fentanyl. You know, some do, but some don't. So, you know, if I make a conscious choice to use drugs, then why are you charging this person with murder? I mean, you know. I'm very supportive of all of the state's attorneys general um, lawsuits against big pharmaceutical companies and Purdue, um, which, um, and, and others that um, frankly, in, in my opinion, are the biggest drug dealers that have not had any consequences other than monetary consequences. Um, you know, these are privately, Purdue's a privately held company um, that has made probably hundreds of millions of dollars off of uh, the suffering of an entire nation and um, that needs to be consistently and continuously highlighted. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Richard Reyes. I'm a professor right here in uh, John Jay. Um, the question that I have actually is, is first to Professor Kennedy, and then if he feels he wants to pass it on to other people, that's fine. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about the, the difference or the similarities between the crack epidemic and the heroin uh, epidemic that we're, the, the open epidemic that we're having right now? And, and, I, and I go especially to you, uh, Professor, because I know you have a lot of experience in the research, you know, going back 20, 30 years. Uh, black people and white people? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Good answer. I mean, first and foremost. Um, and then, uh, uh, and, and everything that flows from yeah. that, which I don't think I need to waste our time getting into because we all know it. Um, so that's not to say it's not important, but it's obvious, right? So, mm -hmm. so enough said on that one. Um, then there are a couple of other important issues. So one is that there's a lot of dying going on, and there was a lot of dying going on in, in the crack era as well. Crack violence was market violence. It was not pharmacological lethality. Crack didn't kill very many people. Crack markets killed people. This is the other way around. It is the drug that is killing people. And so far right now, the new opioid markets are pretty calm. That may be shifting. We're seeing the rise of, of robberies of drug dealers and stick-up crews just as we did back back in the old days, but largely the, the body count is being driven by overdoses, and that is, is a different policy question and a different social question. Um, there is treatment for opioids. There really, there really isn't treatment for stimulants. You know, people use the word treatment for, for cocaine and crack and methamphetamine. There is actual clinical treatment for opioids and there, there are the agonists. There is no, there's no naloxone for stimulants. So there, there are a bunch of options that we did not have um, the last time around. Thank you, um, my name is Asher, uh, and I was just wondering to pick up from the last point that the council member was making. Um, I think it's been in the news recently that uh, Purdue Pharma, I think, or one of their subsidiaries obtained a patent for, um, uh, opioid treatments. So, um, what you, I guess, in general, make of that? I mean, it's. I mean, it's infuriating. I. I, I mean, it is infuriating. Um, here's. I mean, this is a company that unleashed an avalanche on this country, 
and um, I mean, just the thought, the thought that they would continue to reap, reap a, a benefit um, from all aspects of addiction is, um, to me, like a, a it is a, so beyond um, horrible. I, it's, 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 I, I, I think that they should be driven out of business. I think that they should be sued to the point where they're in bankruptcy, period. And, and just to be clear, like I think, I think you're right that Purdue would sort of set the ground for this and um, helped there make, make us in the situation where we are right now, but there are many, many pharmaceutical companies that have reaped the benefits of this. Um, and, you know, sometimes legally, sometimes illegally, that are in the process of being sued, whether or not that will make a difference um, either in their bottom line or in their practices going forward is sort of still unclear, but um, the, the blame definitely sits on Purdue and many other pharmaceutical companies. Hi, Dr. Amina Ali. I am an OBGYN and I deal with women that are in crisis, drug overdose, that's where we know each other, drug overdose, those that are um, pregnant um, uh, due to sexual trafficking and, and the whole night. Um, but what I run, which is my passion now, 30 years in, um, I'm a Desert Storm, Desert, uh, Desert Storm vet. And because of what we had to deal with PTSD side before there was an acronym for it, um, was moral injury. Um, so I run the moral injury network team now, which deals with those that are dealing with the moral consequence, you know, having to go over and kill someone that's not harming you in any way, and then having to do that in the name of her country and, and the whole nine. But what we're dealing with is now we're seeing the overturning of that moral injury into a, more of a moral attrition where we're almost worn down into the single story of African Americans being this and African Americans being that, black and brown being this and the Bronx being this, and almost this wearing down. And then there's a, um, we call it the, 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 uh, in the, in the group, we called it the, uh, what was that, the, the grandness of it all was this single story that's coming down that's being told um, and they have the bigger voice so of course that's the bigger um, message that's coming out. Um, but unfortunately, and, and the question that I'm coming to is, there is free Noxalone and there's free um, treatment uh, errors. Now when we deal, deal with, in the medical side, we deal with the, um, the Vivitrol and the, and the Butte that causes uterine fibroids, so that causes more pain, which causes women to want to use some more and the, and the whole circle behind that. But I guess my question to all of you is, if there was a, um, a speaking point that is not privileged would there be a greater voice in society or in Congress or in, in politics? Um, and I use that word privilege not in the racially side of, of the, I'm talking about privilege as in not knowing, just studying and researching and being around, as you mentioned, you're around doctors that deal with it, but not around the, the actual effects of it. So I'm wondering if there was someone that could piece together a plan with you rather than just sit on the panel and just be the voice of. Can there be um, um, you going to Congress and walking with him and sitting down and writing a bill? And the reason why I'm saying that is because people from the outside in can always speak on what they see, but the people from the inside out need the real help. And this is what I'm constantly seeing, just like with the movie. Great points, but it's not one that is solution-based. It's more just exposure. So I'm wondering where the more of your voices, why is it just one of you speaking of the issue and not more of you sitting up there speaking to the solution? And I, I guess that's my question. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Um, yeah. a, a couple of things are coming to mind. One is, is um, I think with, with the movie specifically, I think we were trying to document like the many, many players on the ground who are trying to address this, whether or not it sh 
it should be more of one population or another population. These were the people who, who we were seeing on the ground doing um, the many different kinds of work that they were doing. But I think more generally speaking, I think you're absolutely right that we have this problem of lack of representation of, um, of drug users, frankly, and of, of people in recovery. Um, I see this, sorry, I see this all the time with reporters who are reporting on this, um, who have not really bothered to talk with someone in recovery or someone who is in active drug use for um, a given story. This happens all the time. Um, and I've, I've literally given talks at media conferences saying, if you're gonna report on this, you need to talk with the people who are going through it. Um, and I think that the lack of re representation is for a number of reasons, stigma being one of them, as we were talking about before. Um, and, and also just the, the fact that this is, um, for a number of communities, this is a relatively quiet devastation that's happening. You don't see, um, one mom put it to me this way. She said, when your son dry, dies of an overdose, you're not getting casseroles at your door. Like, there's still this basic lack of understanding of what it means to be addicted, what it means to overdose. And as a result, you're not, you haven't seen the same sort of advocacy among the people who've been affected by this as you have in, um, in other sort of communities where people are affected by something that's killing people. So you don't have like the mothers against drunk driving equivalent for overdoses and you don't have the like every town equivalent for overdoses, right? In the same way that, that you would have for a lot of other things that are killing people. Well, I come from harm reduction peer, right? Um, yeah, the stigma and the judgment is very real. And we get called to many things, but we're not compensated for it. You know, and, but I, I have to stand up. And, and, and I don't care if I get paid or not, I have to, because I lived, I survived. But too many are dying even now. Like it's, you know, it's, I gotta fight. I have children. I have nine grandchildren coming behind me. I have six children, you know, like, and my community. So I have to continue the fight. And we are doing, we just, ex, we are the experts, right? Because we live this, exactly. right? We are the experts. And in the peer network, we, we're stepping up. I got peers coming out with me. I'm co-chair of the peer network, but I, they come out with me and we're doing the work. And we weren't getting paid, right? Third Avenue bid. Yeah, everybody got money and they could provide the sandwiches, but they ain't giving us none. But we're going to continue the work because it's about my community. And you know, look, like, like you said, Councilman, you said maybe this could work in Brooklyn. Maybe this could work somewhere else. It, it might be something big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just right. one people doing it. And I guess the reason why I'm asking that is because you said that not to know was free and that you trained it. But to know that KSAC and peer recovery, the, the, the program, mm -hmm. the yeah. So my piece is maybe there should be grants to give that training free as well so that there will be more hands on the ground to be in support of you so that more of the programs that are coming out can be supported by boots on the ground. And the reason why I say that is because if you're going to give someone something free to stop the receptors on the brain initially, once mm -hmm. they get sober or once they get at least clean, the help now has to be, has to pay for the certification and out of a jurisdiction that is underserved, underprivileged, and underfunded. Well, so now when we do this, we're now having this conglomerate of people that want to be peer advocates, but they have to pay for the fees and the tests and the, and the training and this and that. But yet, we're given free to get you out of the situation, yeah. but we have to pay for someone to help support you to sobriety. I have a, I have a real problem with that. Me too. Just that I think that we as a city have a, an opportunity if we want to do programming that can be really effective and we've worked together and we, we, there, we have a great relationship with Harm Reduction Network and yep. Vocal at the City Council um, so you know we've, 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 we've worked get together but if we have the opportunity to do direct funding 
that can provide for programs that are not, we don't have to make them based on, on Medicaid reimbursement or managed care reimbursement or whatever. We can, we have the opportunity, we can allocate, the city has about $90 billion a year of budget. We can determine that this is a priority and we can put, we can put our money where our mouth is and have not, without it being, you know, we could, we could do pilot programs. We could, um, we could fund it through the health department by directing city tax levy to the health department or to health and hospitals to make it, to make it work that way. I mean, it's, so I mean, I, I, I'm going to continue to advocate for, you know, good, innovative, community-based solutions that, you know, are innovative and are not tied up with, you know, all types of, you know, Medicaid reimbursement or anything like that, or depending on the state or depending on the feds, we have the ability to do it on our own. We should. So I'm going to take a minute on this one myself. Um, and then I think we'll probably have time for one, one more question. So I'll, I'll go back to the room. So the, the National Network is your host today. And the National Network for Safe Communities has a way of going, going at these issues that has really proved out over time. Because what we find is that over and over and over again on these issues that in this case is a national crisis, as the violence associated with the crack epidemic was a national crisis, um, over and over and over again, people go directly from that realization to action without stopping to look at what was going on. So, Julia, you may remember this when we first spoke about this. Um, you were asking some of these same questions about, what, about the you know, appropriateness of some of the law enforcement responses that uh, you just saw. And one of my comments to you was, don't be too hard on them. Nobody's telling them what to do. They are desperate. There are people that are dying. They don't know what to do. They feel responsible. And they're getting no help from anybody in thinking this through. They are entirely on their own, as is almost everybody else who's struggling with this. A lot of these problems have proved themselves much more amenable to action when when they get unpacked. And uh, when we started our work on homicide 25 years ago in the middle of the crack epidemic, there had been no study of the violence. There were lots of prescriptions, there were lots of people doing lots of things, but in 10 years of escalating body count, nobody had gone to ground and really looked at what was going on. And it didn't take very long when we did that to come up with is now an article, it's, a, it's the conventional wisdom, which is in the most dangerous communities, there aren't very many high risk people. And it's actually a lot easier to engage with them effectively than, than people think. And what you're doing reads to me like the credible messenger movement in violence prevention, right? And Julia and I were part of a closed door session not that long ago in which we got national experts from around the country and said to them, what is going on here? When the dope comes across the border, how is it moving around the country? Are those thick markets or are they thin markets? When you are in your city and there are people dying all over the place, how is the stuff, once it hits your, your, your city limit, how is it moving around? Do you have lots of connects or almost no connects? Um, is it a layer of these user dealers and then it's everywhere or is it everywhere instantly? Is the fentanyl coming prepackaged or is it coming in decks of cards or is it the dark web? Is there a dealer on every corner or, or is it one structure? And over and over and over, and, in, and, and how many overdoses are you getting? How many people are not dying because they've been saved? How many of them are repeat victims? And over and over and over again, whether it was the national intelligence structure or local people, the answer was, we just don't know. And nobody has done the basic inquiry on which action could be built. And so the national network is, is setting up to do some of that work. And you never know what it's going to show or where it's going to lead until you do it. That's why we do it. Um, 
but I'm a little bit optimistic because this has worked over and over again, so maybe we could talk about this in a year or two. So that's, that's, that's what we're going to try. So final question? Um, I'm Roy. So I want to piggyback off of some things that you were saying. Um, I believe that, so whether we're talking about, so I come from the criminal justice sector. So whether we're talking about uh, uh, the sector of people who are addicted to drugs, or we're talking about immigration, or we're talking about incarceration, as was emphasized, you cannot get to the solution without being led by those who are most impacted. You have to have those. So you mentioned some closed room meetings with some experts. I wonder how many of those experts were actually impacted personally themselves with addiction. Um, I believe that you know, it, it, you know, a lot of times we like doing studies, but studies don't always get to the root cause of what the issue is. We spend a lot of millions and billions of dollars of doing studies and research. But at the end of the day, when we go to those who are most impacted and we ask them to share their stories, we realize that a lot of the answers to the questions that we're looking for are in the stories. So we have to continue and you have a moral responsibility based off of where you're at and wherever your position or your organization is to also hire those who are most impacted to get feedback from them when you're talking about addressing these issues. It just can't be people. We just talked about these, this, this is just another system of oppression. I believe these are all different systems of oppression that are all built off of institutional racism. So now we have to understand that when we start talking about a team of experts, it can't be a team of 20 white experts who are never impacted in their lives. We have to bring diversity, we have to bring stories, we have to elevate the voices of those who are most impacted, and we'll find that a lot of the answers we're looking at, when we're willing to be led by them, so it's not it's one thing to just ask the question, but be willing to be led by them is a whole nother question altogether, and I believe that some of the solutions will come about once we do that. So my question to the panel is this, is very brief. What can the audience, because I believe whenever you conduct a panel, you should be getting to the essence of what can the audience do to assist. So what can the audience do to assist in disseminating, dismantling this system right now, as we know, with its word semantics, crack era, opioid addiction, war on drugs, Billy, ba Billy, Sarah, and Jane is impacted, so now we need treatment centers. We, we, we know it's all word semantics, so what can the audience do to assist in dismantling, whether it's voting, whether it's like reach out to someone, whether it's to mentor to someone, whether it's to provide an opportunity, we have to get to the essence of what the audience can do. Can I just add one, one thing there? I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and again and again, you see in the history of of responding to drug epidemics that you see uh, science and then policy catching on to something that drug users and, and people who are advocate, advocating for drug users were saying like decades before. So you know, you had people saying, oh, I think that this is, um, this is actually changing something in your brain. This is a neurological thing. And for a long time it was, oh, it's a moral thing, it's a moral failing. Now, you know, now there's finally an understanding that this is, this is, there's some neurological underpinnings to this. This is a disease. Um, way before it was legal, you had people saying, oh, we should probably hand out needles, you know, clean needles. That was not necessarily legal. That's just something that drug users and people who were working with them decided to do because they realized that this was going to save a lot of lives. Um, and they had to do this underground for a very long time, and it took um, a lot of organizing in order to make that just a normal thing. Same thing with naloxone distribution. Um, and now you're seeing that today with safe injection facilities. Um, for people who aren't, aren't familiar with them, Michelle was talking about this as well. They're often called safe consumption facilities. Um, and it's basically a clean, safe space for people to go and use drugs. And there is naloxone there, there are clean needles there. This rubs a lot of people the wrong way. Um, you know, it's not particularly intuitive in a similar way to how Handing out naloxone probably wasn't particularly intuitive, or handing out clean needles wasn't particularly in intuitive. But um, drug users, people who are advocating for them, this is like the single biggest thing that I hear all the time um, from that community. And also, in, in this case, there are a lot of models for this. Um, 
oh, I think over 100 countries now have safe injection facilities that are legal. Dozens and dozens of studies have been done on them, finding that they are effective. Um, but in the US, no one will touch it. Some a handful of cities have said that they're interested. But realistically, it's going to be a very long time until we get there. Um, because, because there's just sort of this mismatch between what um, people are, are saying makes sense and, and what policymakers and experts, as you say, are saying makes sense. Vote people from our community into office. That's big. We need people that come from our community. We also need to find, like for me, I know where I'm good at, and my boots on the ground, that's where I'm good. That's where I'm at. Whatever you can bring to the table that you're good at, like you can um, maybe make sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> you know I said that, right? <laughs> I need 200. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying, whatever you can donate your time, come out, you know, with the, I mean, have a community meeting and, and come together. That's what we did, and, and, and we're getting stuff done. You know, I mean, it's not, it, at first we were like, what the hell are we doing? Are we, is this really gonna work? But now we're seeing people actually waiting for us every Thursday morning, waiting for that sandwich, waiting for that hug, waiting to get some naloxone. They use their naloxone, they need another kit. You know, oh, I need detox this week. You know, we're seeing it. It might be little steps, but we're seeing something happening, so we're gonna continue. They try to tell us, oh no, now we leave this site and go to another. No, we're not leaving the site. I'm not leaving, I'm still gonna go out there. So now we're gonna do another site, but we're still gonna keep that one. So, I mean, I've, we gotta fight for it. So demand accountability from your local representatives and from your city. <laughs>